For anyone who's a fan of my series on company declines, this video is similar to it. It does feature a company decline and a bankruptcy, but I chose not to label it that way because it's not really the focus of the video. You know how Wonder Woman shows up in Batman vs Superman, but since the movie's not built around her, it's not labeled as a Wonder Woman movie? This is the exact same thing. Exact. And this episode is about Vans. The two words that probably come to your mind when I say Vans are Warp Tour. Well, not really. That may be true for some, but the actual two words that come to your mind are likely skateboarding and shoes. It's not the only thing they sell, but it's by far what they're most known for. Aside from shoes, they do offer shirts, pants, jackets, hats, sunglasses, backpacks. They have an entire clothing and accessory line. It's not all intended for skateboarders either. They're big in the world of surfing and snowboarding too. The bottom line is if you're into any kind of extreme sport, Vans want you to wear their stuff. And a lot of them do. They've been pretty successful in their mission. Even if you're not into these sports, you might wear some of their stuff. It's not just sold at specialty stores. You can go to Kohl's and buy a pair of Vans. Today, it looks like the company is doing well, but it's been a bit of a bumpy road for them. Starting on day one, the name Vans comes from a guy named Paul Van Doren. He's the person who started the whole company back in 1960. It was even initially called the Van Doren Rubber Company. As any shoemaker, he would make the shoe in a factory, then ship it off to the store to be sold. The thing that made him different was he owned that store that he was shipping it to, essentially cutting out the middleman. Unlike the other shoemakers, Paul and his crew had to worry about operating a retail store and making sales to the consumers. But also unlike other shoemakers, he didn't have a third party retailer sharing the profit. They were doing everything themselves and getting all the rewards from it. One of the potential problems with a setup like this is it's a lot to handle. On day one, they had 12 customers and no shoes ready to sell only display models. So the customers placed their orders and were told to come back a few hours later to pick them up so they could rush to produce them, and they did manage to have them ready by the time the customers returned. But then they realized they had no money in the register to make change. They let the customers walk away with the shoes and kindly asked them if they would return the next day and pay them. Luckily all their customers were honest and came back, but there's a couple lessons to be learned from this. One is don't take too much responsibility. The Van Doren Rubber Company took on more responsibility than their competitors, and clearly couldn't handle it in the beginning. These weren't little mistakes. For the opening of their shoe company, they didn't have shoes or money. They soon improved, but maybe they should have started out smaller and worked their way up. First impressions can be meaningful. And the other lesson is tolerance. The customers seemed to sympathize with the new business. They didn't storm out when they learned they would have to wait for their shoes, and still hung in there when they learned they would have to come back a third time just to pay them. The company quickly got their act together. They made good shoes that brought in the customers, and they were able to expand. That first store and the first factory were both in California, and early on nearly all their stores were in California. I'm not sure if their initial intention was to draw in the skaters, but they did. Vans became big in California, skating was big in California, surfing as well. My guess is some of them started to show interest in their shoes and Vans decided to run with it. By the early 80s, Vans had successfully became the shoe for California skaters and surfers, which is impressive. I'd call that a successful 15 years, but let's face it, that's still a very narrow customer base compared to what they have today. The next step for Vans was to spread to the rest of of the country. The way they did this was a little odd. Wait a minute, there's no birthday party for me here. <laughs> In 1982, there was a movie called Fast Times at Ridgemont High that featured a character named Jeff Spicoli. Yeah, I know that, dude. Mr. Spicoli. That's the name they gave me. Spicoli wore a pair of Vans in this movie and it made the rest of the country want to wear them too. Now, I know, that's a hard sentence to believe. I once saw Ted eating a bag of Doritos, and it didn't do all that much for the brand, but hear me out here. The Spicoli character was an exaggerated embodiment of the California surfer. All I need 
hear some tasty waves, cool buzz, and I'm fine. And California surfers are cool. Plus, they weren't just any vans, they were the iconic pair, the slip-ons with the checkerboard pattern, to this day you can buy them. This was the rest of America's first exposure to them. It's a cool looking shoe. And he wasn't just wearing them, they were a part of his overall look. There's even a whole scene where he's holding them. From what I've read, this was the actor's idea, Sean Penn, for the character to wear them because he felt that this was the perfect shoe for that character. Anyone who saw this movie and wanted to either imitate Spicoli, dress as a surfer or a skater, or just thought it was a cool looking shoe, was now looking to buy it. From that point, their business just took off. I mean, expanding their product lines, opening new factories, hiring more workers, it still sounds crazy when I say it, but that movie brought the company to the next level. And then, only two years later, bankruptcy. The reason for it, as told by the company, is due to their wide range of products. The story they give is that they offered too many different shoes and it was simply costing them too much to do it. As you can imagine, it costs more to produce a hundred options than it would to produce two options. If that's the case, it shouldn't have been too hard to recognize that they needed to narrow their selection. If they had brought in a cost accountant, I imagine he would have caught onto it right away. It wouldn't have gotten to the point of bankruptcy. See, a cost accountant can figure out the costs associated with each stage of production and each product and ultimately tell you which shoes are losing you money. Like probably their iconic checkerboard pattern shoe was bringing in big profits, but some other random shoe was actually losing them money. It's hard to tell what's doing what unless you take a closer look. So to me, declaring bankruptcy and just saying they were producing too much variety seems a little strange. They should have identified which shoes were losing them money and made adjustments. Now, Here's my suspicion. Sometimes you hear about a guy winning the lottery, then four months later declaring bankruptcy. It turns out he ran out and bought a big house and a boat and one of those $1,800 hamburgers. Way more than he can afford. I don't have the numbers to back this up, but Vans had all this new demand for their shoes, built up their facilities, maybe to a point where they needed their high sales to continue. Then it's two whole years since the movie. No one cares about Spicoli anymore. Other companies have entered the market with similar looking shoes, if not just knockoffs. It's just my suspicion. But even if they experienced some decrease in demand, people were still demanding these shoes, and when that's the case, there's a good chance of making a comeback. They cut back their offerings, made other cuts, and shifted their focus to custom designs. Unlike many other brands, Vans had always proudly made their shoes in America, which cost much more overall, but it did make things happen faster. If you ordered a custom made shoe from Vans, you were usually able to get it with in a week or two. If you ordered it from somewhere else, you would probably have to wait for it to cross the ocean, and who knows how long it would take. Things like this helped them pay off their debt and get back to a good financial position. In the early 90s, they did give in and start producing a lot of their stuff overseas, make any ethical arguments you want to there, but it was the best business decision. In 1988, Paul Van Doren and the other owners sold the company to someone we wouldn't recognize, and then in 2004, they sold the company to VF Corporation, another name you may not recognize, but they're big. I won't go too much into that here because I'll save it for a future episode, but just to help you visualize how big they are, they bought Vans, not a pair of shoes, but the entire company, for about $400 million. Yet today, VF Corporation is valued at over $30 billion on the stock market. So either Vans has become 75 times more valuable over the past 14 years, or there's a lot going going on with this VF corporation. It's the second one. Were you reading the headline of the article I just showed you, specifically the part where it said clothing giant and expanding closet of well-known brands? So we can look forward to that episode sometime in the future. But today, they own the Vans brand, a brand that struggled to make it past its first day, but were able to compose themselves and become a brand associated with California's skating and surfing. They were eventually able to use their popularity from a movie to become a national brand. They encountered some more trouble and ended up filing for bankruptcy, but then again recovered and found a way to differentiate themselves. Today, they're not just a national brand, they're an international brand that's recently celebrated their 50th anniversary. Let me know in the comments anything you have to say about Vans. Here's an interesting question. Vans had nothing to do with their shoe being featured in Fast Times at Ridgemont High, so would you say they were just lucky in this case? That movie is a big part 
part of their success. So is their entire business built on luck? I'd say yes, but not completely. It was lucky for them that the movie and the character became so popular. It was lucky for them that they even ever existed. But the part that wasn't luck was Sean Penn bringing in those shoes that day. It was the perfect shoe for that character. And it was Vans that made that the perfect shoe for that character if you follow what I'm saying. Let me know your thoughts on it, and let me know your thoughts on everything else. I'd like to hear what you have to say. Thank you for watching.